Well, good morning. Great to see everybody this morning in the first Sunday of March. Glad you're with us both via Zoom and via YouTube. And I trust the Lord to bless our study in his word today. Let's pray and we'll get started. We're going to be looking at this topic today, the most ignored part of life. And uh, you say, what, where is this going to go? Let's, let's find out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to meet even uh, via technology to be able to utilize this for uh, the advancement of truth and, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray you bless the understanding of the word and the response to it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and there's a verse of scripture I want us to look at that we'll just look at for a little while, and then we're going to be looking at a number of scriptures as we normally do. In our modern society, there's, there's a part of life that many people ignore, many people are not really investing themselves in, and what I mean by that part of life, even our very being, you know, we are a three-part being, we are comprised of body, soul and spirit and there's one of those three that the average person does not give much attention to uh some may even say that doesn't even exist but here in first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 the bible says and the very god of peace sanctify you wholly and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ and in this verse, we see very clearly that God is telling us that we are a three-part being. We have spirit and soul and body. Many people want to think that we're just body and soul, but that's not true. We have a third part. It's our spirit, and it's not the same thing as our soul, though the two are inseparably connected. You know, obviously, our, our body is the physical part of life. It's, it's the, the flesh and bones that we are comprised of that have been perfectly designed by our creator uh, from when we are just a, you know, a, just a, a little cell and it expands beyond that. And we become uh, born into this world with physical life and we grow and, and, and a lot of people focus their every day upon this part of our being, the fact that we have physical life. So many people are focused on, on fitness, and that's not a bad thing, but there's more to life than, than physical fitness. Or talking about people are focused on what they're going to put into their physical body, uh, what they're going to wear on their physical body. They, they're focused on sports, recreation, and having a good time in the physical realm. And that's the body. That's where we seem to, as a human race, seem to want to focus our attention as long as I feel good in my body. But there's also the soul. The soul is the, the mental part of life. It's, it's the part where our, our, we have actually three parts to our soul. There's the intellect side, obviously, where the thinking is, and, and that may education and, and developing the brain and using the brain. At least I hope people are focusing on developing and using their brain. Um, we have the, the mind. We also have the emotion, and we have the volition. The emotion is obvious. It's our feelings. And God designed us to be people that have feelings. And some people have a lot of feelings. Some have less feelings. But nonetheless, we are people that God designed that have intellect. We have emotion. And we also have volition. Volition would be our, our will and our ability to make decisions and, and choose. And that is our, our volition. And those three together make our personality out of intellect a varying amount of emotion you take those three and you adjust the levels on them and you have all these personalities that exist in the world today and that's the mental part that's the soul it's our world consciousness it's who we are in this world but then we also have a spirit and the spirit is our god consciousness and even people who say they're atheist um they know better Deep down within their hearts, we're going to look at some scripture later, I think that will we'll show that as well. Deep down, we know better. In our heart of hearts, every human being knows that there is a God, that he exists, that there is a creator that created all look around at everything that has been created. And it's later is the one that created everything that we see. We see in the creation, we see intelligent design. 
And if there's intelligent design in everything, then there must be an intelligent designer. And God is the one who has created all that we see. But we are three parts. We are body, soul, and spirit. And those three are, are who we are. It's, it's, it's our being, a three-part being. And notice the order that God gives us here in verse 23. It says, uh, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body. Oftentimes, we will say body, soul, and spirit. But the correct order is spirit, soul, and body in order of importance. Our spirit is the most important part of our being. It is the part of us that will live forever. And our soul is attached to it. And it's important that we know that. But the spirit is oftentimes the most ignored part of our being, yet it's the most important. And I want to talk about today about our spirit. What is, what is your spirit? What, is, what does God expect from our spirit and so on and so forth? First of all, let's look at the condition of our spirit. Go with me to Ephesians chapter number two. We're going to look at the condition of our spirit. In Ephesians chapter two, verse number one, it says, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. A very interesting verse, Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Obviously, he's not referring to physical death, because if, if, they're, if they're physically dead, then you can't speak to them. And so this is being written to people in the sense that he's not referring to physical death, but spiritual death in the sense that the word death is a separation. That's what the word death means. You know, when someone dies, we mean their soul and spirit have been separated from their body. We say they, they, they're dead. And when the Bible says here that someone is dead in trespasses and sins, it means they are separated, separated from God. Because God, God is so holy and just that he will have nothing to do with sin. We are dead in trespasses and sins, and that's what the Bible is referring to. So when, when we are lost before salvation, someone is separated from God because of their trespasses and sins. In fact, go back to Genesis in chapter number three, way back in the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God warned them. In, actually, back in chapter 2, in verse 17, when God gave the commandment, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, he says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, God, God knew what was going to happen, right? God knew what man would choose, just like God knew from eternity past the choices that you would make in life. And God knew that Adam and Eve would choose to sin against him by eating of the fruit that he told them not to eat. And he says, in the day that you eat, you're going to die. Now, God was not referring to a physical death because in chapter three, that's what they do. They partake of that fruit. They eat of it, but they're still alive physically. But spiritually, they died that day. Spiritually, they died. They became separated from God on a spiritual level. Now, God, God still communicated with them. In chapter 3, he says to them in, in verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And it's interesting, just as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves from God's presence. And that's how we are as humans today. When we are sinning against God, we hide ourselves. We don't want to be close to God. We don't want to be near God when we are in sin, and we know better. But God had fellowship with them. God had great communication with them prior to their sin. But when they sinned, they died. They were separated from God, spiritually speaking. And that's what Ephesians 2 is referring to. That when we are lost before salvation, we are separated from God. Go to Psalm 58 with me. In fact, from birth, we are separated from God. It is when we, as soon as we are born into this world, in reality, as soon as we are conceived in the womb, we are spiritually separated from God until the day in which we are born again. And we'll deal with that in just a little while. We need to be spiritually born because 
when we are physically born, we're already spiritually dead. Our spirit is not connected to God. It says in Ephesians 2, 1, we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are separated from God because of our sin nature. And here in Psalm 58, look what it says here in verse number three. Psalm 58, verse three says this, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. <laughs> you, ever, you ever wonder who teaches children how to lie? I mean, who teaches their two-year-old how to lie? I, I, never, I never taught my children to lie, but guess what? They all tried. They all did it. They've lied. I lied. Who taught me? I don't think my parents taught me how to lie when I was a little boy. It just was my nature to lie because that is our sin nature. We inherit that. In fact, go to Romans chapter number uh, five with me. Romans chapter number five in the New Testament. We, we, are, we are people, as soon as we're born, as soon as we're conceived, we have a sin nature. And because of that sin nature, we are separated from God. In fact, let me read to you while you're turning there from Psalm 51. Psalm 51 verse 5 says this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. As soon as the child was conceived in the womb, one thing is true, they'll be sinners. It is our sin nature. Where did it come from? Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 gives us the answer. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Our sin nature is passed from generation to generation to generation. And as soon as a child is conceived, as soon as that child is born, one thing we know about that child is that they're going to sin, they're going to lie, it's just their nature. They're going to be going astray from God. That is the nature because of our spiritually dead condition. And because we're born that way, it doesn't take long before the sin nature manifests itself. And if you think about this, oftentimes we say, oh, people are sinners because they sin, but the reality is they sin because they're sinners. Think about that. We would say, oh, he's a sinner because he did this, this, and this. No, because he's a sinner, he did this, this, and this. The root problem is not what we do. The root problem is who we are. We are sinners by nature. That's the problem. And the sin that we commit is just the fruit of who we are. It's the result of who we are. We are sinners from birth. We, we are sinners by nature. We are also sinners by choice because we choose to yield to our nature, our sin nature, and we're sinners in action. We, we, we want sin and we choose to sin. Now, hopefully and thankfully, not everyone does every sin possible at any given moment. But as time goes on, just like it was before the days of the great flood that flooded the whole world, as recorded in the book of Genesis, just as it was then, it says the last times will be. Jesus said, just like the days of Noah, that's what it will be like when he returns. And our world is quickly on pace. You say, what do you mean? We're, we are quickly on pace to reach where the world was before the flood, where the Bible says the thoughts of the intents of men's heart were only evil continually. Now, we're not there yet, but we're getting there quickly because, I mean, if you just rewind 60, 70, 80 years ago, certainly the world was not as wicked in its thinking as it is today. And that's the dangerous place where we are today. People are so wicked in their thinking, then it's just a matter of carrying it out. We are, we are sinners by nature, but we're sinners by choice and then by action. We give our will to sin, then we give our bodies to acting out that sin. So from, look at, look at Ephesians 4 with me, go past Romans to the book of Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians, chapter number 4, because, because of our sin nature, we are spiritually dead. The Bible refers to it twice here as being alienated. 
being separated, being alienated. In Ephesians 4, verse 17, it says this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Because our hearts are blinded, because we, we and why are they blinded? Because of sin. And the only thing that can break through our heart is the gospel of Jesus Christ. How that Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for our sin, to pay for our sin. Why? Because he alone is qualified to pay for it because he was sinless. He is God who took on human flesh and he was the one that laid down his life and went to the cross to pay for our sin so that you and I could receive his righteousness and be saved. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again the third day because death has no power over him. He has power over death. He is the author of eternal life and he alone can save. Look at Colossians. After Ephesians, you find Philippians, then Colossians. In Colossians chapter 1, we see a similar statement. So back there in Ephesians 4, we see that as sinners, we are alienated from God. Because our hearts and minds are blinded because of our sin. And we are separated from God. But when we let the gospel of Christ in, the light of the gospel, then we can be saved. In Colossians 1, verse 20, it says this, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So when we're lost, we are enemies, we are alienated. Not that God's an enemy against us, we're enemies against him. Because with our sin, we offend and attack his, him in, 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 in his very heart of holiness. He's offended. We are enemies against him. We are alienated from him. But then salvation comes. And God can save us from our condition. In fact, the Bible refers to our condition as being lost. Jesus said to uh, Zacchaeus in Luke 19 10 that he's come to seek and to save that which was lost look at second Corinthians chapter four with me second Corinthians chapter number four is another place where the Bible uses the term lost and this is the condition of our spirit we are dead in trespasses and sins we are alienated from God we are lost but thankfully there's a savior that's looking to seek and to save that which was lost he wants to save everybody. The problem is not everybody wants to be saved. People love their sin and they don't want to come to Christ. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three says this, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, that little G God, that's Satan, he's the God of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so lost people, it's like they've got blinders on. That was me before I was saved. Even though I grew up in a church, going to a church and hearing the gospel, I was blinded to my own condition before a holy God. But when I allowed the gospel to come in, when I allowed the gospel to penetrate my ears and, and go past my ears into my mind and then eventually into my heart, then the light of the gospel came in and I saw my condition before a holy God that I was a sinner that deserved his judgment, but I didn't want it. I wanted Christ instead and his blood washed away my sin when I put my faith in him, which was preceded by a heart of repentance where I don't want sin. But if we're, if we're lost um, and, if, and if we're hiding the gospel, we're hiding the gospel from lost people. We must give the gospel, give the good news to people so that light can penetrate their darkened hearts and minds. Look at, look at the gospel of John with me. So the condition of our spirit is that we're dead before we're saved. We are alienated from God. We're lost. And in this condition, we are condemned. We are condemned before a holy God. In John chapter number three, in verse number 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's God's heart. 
Here's God's desire. He wants every human being to be saved. He does not want any human being to perish. It says in verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God wants every human being to be saved, and salvation is through Christ. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And in this verse, Jesus Christ is making it very clear that if you're not trusting in him, if you're not believing in his salvation, then you are under condemnation because of your condition. You're lost. You're alienated from God. You are offensive to God. Because Verse 19, this is why people stay lost. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Here's the bottom line. People love their sin. They love their darkness, and they don't want the light to upset their life of sin. And as a result, they're under condemnation. And a wise person would, would say, wait a minute. There's no sin in this world go, worth going to hell over. I must be made right with God. Verse 36 says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's the condition. The condition of our spirit is that we are dead, alienated, lost, and condemned. But this is what God does. Go In this book of John, go to chapter 16. Here's where God is so good to us. God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of, of grace. He's a God of long-sufferingness. He is patient, but he's still holy, just, righteous, and has wrath over our sin. But because God is love, and because he is merciful, and because he is gracious, he does not want us to stay in our lost, condemned condition. He wants us to be saved. And so this is what Jesus said when he left this earth, before he left. He said in verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. The Comforter, by the way, is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. He said, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, here's what the Spirit of God has been doing since Christ ascended into heaven. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Here is the, the threefold ministry of the Spirit of God. He is in this world, and he is speaking to the hearts of lost people. He is speaking to the hearts of people who are spiritually dead because he wants to make them spiritually alive in salvation. But before they'll be saved, his ministry is to convince men of their sin. That's what it says there in verse 9 to convince them of sin, to convict them of their sin. And the Spirit of God is so good and so gracious, and He is holy. He hates sin, and He begins to prick the hearts of lost people, condemn people, to show them their sin before His holiness. And you know, we are sinners by nature, but that's no excuse for the fact and reality that we are sinners. And the Holy Spirit is zinging the heart he's zinging he's it's like he's like he's like he's convicting and making you feel guilty inside and good because we ought to feel guilty over our sin we ought to feel guilty when we are violating and offending a holy god in fact look at romans uh, keep your finger there in, in john chapter number 16 but quickly look at romans in chapter 2 that's why god gave us a conscience God gave us a conscience to convict us, and that's what his spirit uses to convict us when we sin. In uh, Romans 2, verse 14, it says, for when the Gentiles, that's non-Jewish people, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, 
do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And so there we see how God is written on our hearts. Our conscience makes us feel guilty. And if that's not enough, God has also given us his law. Look in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And so the Holy Spirit, using two things, both the conscience and secondly, the written law, which they're synonymous in the sense that they, they speak of the same thing, that God is holy and we are violating his holiness. And the whole point of God's spirit doing that is to lead us to Christ. In fact, just listen as I read, or you can turn there if you wish. In Galatians chapter 3, in verse number 24, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. In other words, nobody is saved. Nobody is made right with God by keeping the law. The purpose of the law is to convict us and show us that we're sinners. And then, secondly, to bring us to Christ. Because someone who, who sees the law for what it is and is, is under the guilt of the law, they realize the only way they'll be saved is for Christ to do it. Because they can't, they can't keep the law. We cannot keep the law. It is impossible. Nobody will ever get to heaven by how good they are because nobody can keep the law. We break it. We violate it. And if anyone's honest, if you want to turn to this later, you can study it on your own. In Exodus chapter 20 of the Ten Commandments, and, and maybe not in, in actual physical reality have you broken all ten, but I bet you if you're honest in your heart you have. You've broken all ten of them. And so God, God wants us to feel the guilt. Go back to John 16. We ought to feel guilty. And when our conscience bothers us, when the law condemns us, may it lead us to Christ and the Spirit of God. He's ministering to us by making us feel the sting of our sin. It says in verse number 10 of righteousness. Here's the second thing the Spirit of God does. Not only does he convict us over our sin, but he convicts of righteousness. We're not righteous, but Jesus Christ is. And he says, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Jesus Christ is righteous. Therefore, he's qualified to ascend into heaven and be with his father. But you and I, we're not qualified. We're sinners. We are separated from God. But Christ, he's righteous. He goes to his father. And when Christ was on the earth, I know that people were bothered by what he had to say because he preached the way of salvation. He lived a righteous life. And the, and the religious people, the religious people were so bothered by him living righteously. And that's even true today. When you, when you live righteously by the strength and the indwelling of the Spirit of God, people out there who are religious, they don't like that. People are just out and out lost and are not religious. They, they, don't, they don't care. They may say, oh, that's great. Glad, you, uh, glad you're doing the right thing. But it's the religious people that get so agitated by people who simply want to obey God. Why is that? Except that their own conscience is bothering them. And Christ, when he lived a righteous life, the religious crowd hated him. And they were the ones that persecuted him. But when the Spirit of God came into the world, he preached and convicted us. I shouldn't say he preached, but in our hearts he is. He's convicting us of the fact that Jesus is righteous and we are not righteous. And it says in verse 11, there's one more thing. He says of judgment. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. You know, Satan is the prince of this world. He's the God of this world. He is the one that is leading and blinding people's eyes and leading them in rebellion against God, capitalizing on our sin nature and the lust that dwell in our, in our own bodies. And he's capitalizing on them to lead us in further committing of sin and rebellion against God. But here's what the Spirit of God also ministers to us, that there's a judgment. 
there's a judgment that's coming and you know it. There's a judgment coming and Satan will be judged and all those who follow Satan, all those who follow this world of sin, they will be judged too. And the only answer is then for them to turn to Christ and be saved. In 1 John chapter number 2, in verse 14, it says, I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Those who have been saved have overcome the wicked one. Why? Because in salvation, God moves in. God, God's spirit indwells us and gives us victory over what Satan wanted to do. He wanted us to be blinded all the way to hell. But God in his love and mercy sent his spirit. His spirit ministered to us and convicted of our sin, our, our lack of righteousness. But Christ is righteous and that there's a judgment coming. And when we respond to the spirit of God, he will give us that victory, that overcoming of the wicked one and the world that this wicked one rules. Verse 15 says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And those are the three areas in which Satan is tempting people. He's blinding them and leading them in these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I tell you what, that last one has really been increasing so much in recent years. The pride of our sin nature. We are, we are proud people. Every human being is a person of pride and it's an offense to god it's a lie the pride of life look who i am god 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 if, if we are filled with the spirit of god we would say something like this i am nothing god is everything even john the baptist said he must increase i must decrease because god is worthy of glory and honor man is not man is not to be glorified man is not to be worshiped we're sinners we are all sinners. And there will be a judgment for sinners if we don't turn to Christ. Here's the last thing I want to look at and we'll, we'll close. Look in John chapter 3. That was First John. Let's go back to the gospel of John in chapter number 3. So the condition of our spirit is that we are dead. We are separated from God. We are alienated from God. We are lost. But God in his love for us sent his spirit to minister unto us, to convince us of sin, of righteousness, of judgment to come. And God wants us to be saved. And so his Holy Spirit, after he convicts us, he calls us to be saved. And that's what John 3 is all about. You know, a lot of people have no idea what John 3 is all about when it comes to being born again. Look at verse 3 of John 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, this is Nicodemus, a, a ruler of the Jews. He said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There, there is a straightforward statement that Jesus Christ made that ye must be born again. If, if you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean? That's what Nicodemus said in verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Okay, let's back up. Remember, we're a three-part being body soul and spirit but we read and we studied how we are spiritually dead from our physical birth and jesus is bringing these truths together here in john 3 how that we were spiritually dead we are spiritually dead and now we need a spiritual birth you've had a physical birth you've been born of the flesh that which is born of the flesh is flesh and you have physical life because of the physical birth. But now every human being needs a spiritual birth. And when we have a spiritual birth, that means we have spiritual life. But without a spiritual birth, we are still spiritually 
dead, meaning that our spirit is not, not connected to God. But when we do get saved, our spirit is made alive, and we are now in connection and communication with God like never there was before. And that's why he says born of water. That's the physical birth, the, the watery womb in which a person is physically born. But the spirit of God is the one that almost like a womb, he is there convincing you of sin, convincing you of righteousness, convincing you of the judgment to come, and then calling you to be saved. And if we're not saved, if we've not been born again, we will not see the kingdom of God. We will, we will spend eternity in hell. That's why it said in Ephesians 2, verse 1, and you have he quickened. That word quickened means to make alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead, but Christ quickens us. This is being born again. This is being uh, having a spiritual birth. And Revelation describes how there's a second death. The second death is a spiritual death. And so if you die and leave this world, that, that's your first death, right? But the second death that Revelation chapter 20 talks about is when you are cast into the lake of fire forever to be separated from God forever, because that's what death is. It's a separation. But why do people go there? Why do people choose that? It would be so much better for every human being to turn to Christ and leave behind the devil in this world of sin and their sin nature. Say, no, I, I want Christ instead. I want to be saved from my sin. Look at Romans 6. We're going to close here in Romans chapter 6. God calls us to salvation. And look how it's described here. And even after we're saved, God, God's spirit calls us to sanctification, to live a life with Christ. In, in uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, it says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. When we get saved, sin has no longer has dominion over us. Instead, we are servants to Christ. And he gives us the strength and the power to live righteously. And that's why he says we have a choice to make. Don't let sin reign over you. Now, before we're saved, sin controls us. But after salvation, we can yield to the spirit of God. And he gives us the power to live righteously. Look at verse 17. It says, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Before salvation, they were the servants of sin. But... Ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And that is so true. That is the exciting part. When we come to Christ to be saved, when we're ready to be done with all of our sin and ready to forsake our sin nature, that includes the whole thing, right? Then God will set us free from sin by the power of his blood and give us the ability to live righteously. Look at verse 20. It says, For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from what they can live for. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Yeah, laws people, they may say, Oh, I can do whatever sin I want. Yeah, but the end of that is going to be death. Verse 22, But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end, everlasting life. For saved people, they now in salvation can live a holy life, a righteous life. Now, lost people say, why would I want to live a holy life? How boring. Uh, first of all, no, the saved life is not boring. It is wonderful. It is joyful. It is peaceful. It is great. I love, I love living a saved life as opposed to when I was lost. And people who think that the guilt and the shame and the consequences of sin is a fun life, boy, they're, they're blinded. They're blinded. They, they can't see because it's no fun to live with the consequences of sin. It's no fun to, to have to endure the grief and the guilt of a sinful life. And the end of it is going to be everlasting destruction. 
But in salvation, God gives us the strength and the power to live a holy life where there's joy, there's peace, there's blessing. And at the end, there's eternal life because of Christ. As verse 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Eternal life with Christ. And even in this life, he gives us victory over sin. And it's, it's wonderful to be saved, to have the spirit made alive in salvation. I used to be dead. My spirit was dead, but I was born again. God saved me from my sin, which came from my sin nature. He saved me from my sin nature. And he is a great savior. So here's the challenge for you today. What are you focused on in your life? Are you focused on the physical? Are you focused on the mental when we ought to be focused on the spiritual? It's the most impart, important part of our being. Without, without salvation, our spirit is dead. But in salvation, we are made alive. We are spiritually born, being born again. And that's when the joyful life begins in salvation. And even after we're saved, we can continue to feed our spirit and to grow in spiritual things. And it's a joyful thing. But it all starts with salvation. But without this salvation, it's just the physical, it's just the mental, and there's no real joy and satisfaction in life. And the worst part of it is we are under God's condemnation, and our spirit is dead, is disconnected from God. Well, let's pray, and um, if you have any questions, we can entertain some questions in just a moment. Father, thank you for allowing us to meet today virtually. Thank you for truth. Thank you for your the ministry of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our condition and who you are, the great God, the holy God, the creator. Thank you for sending him to minister to us and to convict us and ultimately call us to salvation and, and then save us. Thank you for the time we've had today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I appreciate your attention this morning. And those of you on Zoom, those of you on YouTube, appreciate you you tuning in and may the Lord bless you. If you have any questions, we'd love to be able to take your questions and via email, phone call, um, through social media, we'd love to take questions and may the Lord bless you um, as you consider these truths from the word of God.